So we will start. So thank you everybody to attend uh, this uh, first parallel session of uh, Concur uh, conference. And this session will be about, uh, let's say, uh, model checking, temporal logic, and probabilistic system. So there will be probabilistic system in, uh, in every talk. And uh, the first talk will be given by Stefan Kiefer. It's mainly a talk about how to control a probabilistic system in order to enforce with a probability one uh, a, a property expressed by some uh, temporal logic formula or something like that. Okay, so I let immediately the the, the presentation to Stefan. Maybe somebody can wants to see Stefan. So Anissa can. Okay, so you can see Stefan, you have seen Stefan. Okay, now, Anissa, you can start the video for everybody. Imagine I give you a Markov chain with a distinguished set of golden states like this one. This chain has good runs, runs that visit golden states infinitely often. And here you have an example. The run now is going to alternate between states six and eight forever. The chain also has bad runs, runs that visit golden states finitely often. And again, here you have an example where the chain gets trapped in the states 12, 13, 14, forever. Imagine I give you a restart button, a button that you can press at any time in order to restart the chain. Using this button, you can enforce a good run. How? Well, imagine, for example, that the chain starts to execute and it reaches a state seven. Now you know that no extension of this run will be good, so you can restart. Now, if now the chain continues like this, goes to one, two, and 12, again, you can see that no extension can be a good run, so you can restart and you can continue like this until the chain produces a good run. So to make things more interesting, imagine now that I hide the Markov chain from you. So you only know that behind this box, there is some finite state Markov chain. Now, if you see this run, you cannot be sure that you should restart. You could do it before. You, could, you were restarting before because you knew that this was the Markov chain and that seven was here. But now this could be the Markov chain and then you shouldn't have restarted. Or the Markov chain could be something like this. Uh, the Markov chain can be any finite Markov chain. The question now is, can you still enforce a good run if you don't know the Markov chain? This is the question that we are going to answer in this paper. But before doing so, two comments. First, all results can be extended to arbitrary omega regular properties. So there is nothing special about visiting golden states infinitely often here. And second, let me say two words about applications. The first possible application is live lock avoidance in stochastic systems. You have a model of a stochastic system which can generate a very large Markov chain. And then you want to avoid getting trapped into a live lock. Our techniques allow you to uh, do that. And the second is run exploration in large stochastic models. When you have a model again, which can generate a very large Markov chain, you may uh, be interested in knowing whether there exists at all a run that satisfies a certain property. And uh, this is something that you can find out by restarting, letting the run go until you are fairly sure that the run is going to satisfy the property you want. A restart strategy is a function that assigns to a sequence of states the decision whether to restart or not. And what we are looking for is a restart strategy that satisfies for every finite state chain with probability one that the number of restarts is finite and the run after the last restart is good. If we formulate it like this, then it's clear that there is no solution to the problem. Uh, there are many Markov chains where the probability of good runs is zero. And there, of course, we are not going to find a restart strategy. So actually we make the additional assumption that good runs have positive probability. The probability is not known, but we know that it is uh, non-zero. Now, uh, the next step is to introduce probably the main technical device that we are going to use throughout the paper and the talk, which is the notion of the candidate of a path, a path, a finite path, which is a, a finite prefix of a run in the Markov chain.
A fundamental property of finite state Markov chains is that with probability one, runs eventually get trapped in a bottom strongly connected component of the chain, which we abbreviate as BSCC. So, for example, this run here gets trapped here in this bottom strongly connected component. And moreover, with probability one, the run visits all the states of the BSCC infinitely often. This allows us to conclude that with probability one, a run is good if and only if it reaches a good BSCC, where a good BSCC is defined as a BSCC with at least one uh, golden state. We can now define the candidate of a path. So uh, take a path of the uh, chain, and then this path has visited a number of states and transitions. And we can consider the subgraph of the chain explored by the path. Okay. If uh, that, that subgraph has one single bottom strongly connected component, that's easy to see. If that single strongly bottom strongly connected component consists of only one state without transitions, we say it is trivial. And uh, if the BSCC is non-trivial, contains at least one transition, then that BSCC we call the candidate of the path. It is a candidate for a BSCC of the chain. So uh, let us see an example. If the uh, path contains, has visited the states and transitions marked in red, then this is the candidate because this is the BSCC of the path. If now the path continues with two and three, then three is the BSCC, but it is trivial, so there is no candidate. If the path continues by visiting two from three, then there is again a non-trivial BSCC, which is three, two. This is the candidate. Now, if the path continues with four and then takes the self loop, now four is the current candidate, okay? And if now uh, four, from four we goes to three, then uh, two, three, and four are the current candidate. And uh, in fact, this is going to be the final candidate. It will not change anymore, whatever happens. So um, observe that the candidate can be computed from the path. There is no need to, ch to know the chain. And observe moreover that, uh, as I said, the sequence of candidates eventually stabilizes to a final candidate. In this case, this is going to be the final candidate. And with probability one, the final candidate is a BSCC of the chain. Okay, uh, not, this does not hold, of course, for the previous candidates, but it does for the final candidate. So uh, we say that the candidate is good if it contains at least one golden state. And therefore, with probability one, a run is good if and only if its final candidate is good. Let us see a first solution to our problem, the cautious strategy. The cautious strategy restarts whenever the current path is suspect. And what does that mean? It means that it has a candidate and that candidate is bad. Here is an example. If the path has visited the states and transitions marked in red, then its candidate is just a state four, which is a bad candidate. So at this point, we would press the restart button. Let us see this strategy in action. So we start at zero. At zero, there is no candidate yet, so as shown here. And then imagine that we take the, we go from zero to zero by taking the self loop, right? Then our candidate now is state zero and we press the restart button because it's bad. So now imagine that we go from zero to one and from one to zero back. At this point, we have a candidate. It is again a bad candidate, so we press the restart button again. Now imagine that we go from zero to one, to two, to three, to two. At this point, three, two is a candidate, but it is a good candidate, so we do not press the restart button. Imagine that we continue with uh, by going to four, and now we take the self loop. Now four is a candidate, a bad candidate, so we restart. And uh, now imagine that from zero, we go to one, to two, three, two, four, and then three. So this is now the candidate. And actually this is going to be the final candidate. So the candidate is not going to change anymore. And therefore we will never press the restart button again. So um, how do we prove that the cautious strategy is correct? So first we have to show that 
all bad runs have suspect prefixes, but that's very easy, right? Uh, the, 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 uh, all bad runs with probability one or, or, or all bad runs are going to engage in a strongly connected components without um, uh, uh, golden states, and therefore all bad runs are going to be restarted. The a little bit more interesting part is the other direction. We have to show that runs without suspect prefixes have positive probability. And we are going to do that by showing that there is a finite path such that all extensions of all runs extending that finite path are uh, runs without suspect prefixes. And therefore, they are going to have finite probability, uh, positive probability. So how do we do that? So imagine we start at zero and imagine that there is a, a, a good, that the, the SEC contains a good BCC, BSCC. This has to be the case because the good runs have positive probability. So now we can construct this finite path uh, as follows. First, we go, we reach to this, this uh, good BSCC and then uh, we conduct, we, we follow a lasso. Okay, a lasso in this BSCC, which contains a golden state. And that's always possible, something like this. So this means that the first candidate of the path is going to be a good candidate. And now the idea is to uh, add paths, extend the current path, so that the good candidate becomes larger and larger. Right? So, for example, we do not extend the current path like this, with by going from 11 to 15 and then uh, uh, looping between 14 and 15, because that would generate the bad candidate 14, 15. What we do is go leave the, 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 the area of the, of the lasso by means of a path which returns to the same area. Okay, so for example, like this, we go uh, from 10 to 11 and then 15, 14, 12. And in, in this uh, way, the good candidate has grown, right? But remains good because it is still contains the golden state. And now we can extend again the path so that the good candidate grows again with state uh, 13. For example, we can do that by going from 12 to 10, 11, 13, 10. And now this is already the final candidate. This means that any run which uh, continues from here is going to be a good run. Okay, with probability one, because it will stay within this uh, good BSCC. How many times do we have to restart in average when we use the cautious strategy? Well, consider this uh, Markov chain. And remember that uh, you don't know it, okay? It is hidden from you, which I am representing like this. And we have our restart button. Now imagine that the run goes like this. Uh, you go from zero, it goes from zero to one to two. And now at this moment, it could be, an, it doesn't have to be two, it could be anywhere uh, before uh, reaching the end. At this uh, point, you, uh, the run takes the self loop. It goes from two to two, okay? So at this moment, there is a bad candidate. The candidate contains, yes, the state number two. And therefore we restart. So uh, then uh, the consequence is that the, so we restart and the consequence is that the expected number of restarts of the cautious strategy is two to the n, where n is the number of states and uh, actually minus one. And why is that? Well, because the, we are going to stop restarting only after the chain executes this path, okay? Goes directly to from zero to n without taking any of the uh, self loops. And uh, how long does it take uh, to, to achieve that in average? Well, since each uh, transition has probability one half, the probability of this path is one over two to the n, and therefore the expected number of restarts until this path is executed is uh, two to the n. So now, which is the optimal uh, number of, uh, expected number of restarts, the expected number of restarts of an optimal strategy? Well, it is just one because we don't have to do anything. We never, the, the optimal strategy is never restart. Why is that okay? Well, it's okay because the uh, uh, good runs in this Markov chain have probability one, okay? More generally, if the uh, probability of the good runs is one, uh, is, is a given probability, let's say PG, right? Then the expected number of restarts is going to be one over PG. Right, because the idea is that we will only restart when the run enters a bad bottom strongly connected component, and then in average, after this number 
of uh, restarts, we will see a run which enters a good bottom strongly connected component. So uh, now, so as you can see, we are very far away from an optimal strategy with a cautious strategy. It's not surprising because it's very cautious, right? So actually what we are going to do is to design a bold strategy uh, which achieves this number, this expected number of restarts, one over PG times one, uh, one minus epsilon for any given epsilon bigger than zero. Consider now this Markov chain. Here, the probability of the good runs is one half. Those are the runs that go from zero to N and then from N to G to the golden state. And the bad runs are those that go from zero to N and then to B. So uh, remember, we don't know the Markov chain. And as usual, we have here our restart button. And the problem that we have to solve now is that, you know, in the cautious strategy, if the run goes to zero to one and to two and then you visit the state two again, then the cautious strategy tells you, oh, you should already uh, restart because this might be a bottom strongly connected component. So we want to be bolder. We are not so afraid. We think, oh, well, eventually we will leave two. Let's see. And uh, so the, we don't want to restart too soon. But of course, now if the run continues like this and it goes to N and then it goes to B and it stays in B forever, remember you don't know the chain. So all you know is that I have reached the state N and then I am starting to see B, 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 B. So eventually I have to restart. I cannot let this go on forever. Okay. So uh, the problem is uh, how to do this. And the notion that uh, we are going to use uh, for that is the notion of the strength of a candidate. Assume the Markov chain has executed this path and now the path continues with these transitions and then with this and then a few more and then you start to see that the same states start to repeat and uh, you don't leave that set of states, uh, you continue visiting them again and again. Then uh, your confidence in the fact that there is no way out of this set of states grows. So how can we capture this uh, quantitatively? We do it with the notion of the strength of a candidate, which is the number of times that all states of the candidate have been visited after its discovery. So initially we have no candidate. Now imagine that uh, for the first time we see this candidate, the candidate with the states A, B and C. And then the path continues and we revisit the starts A, B and C again and again, so without changing the candidate. So imagine at some point uh, we have visited A three times, then B six times, then uh, C four times after the discovery. Then we say that the strength is three. This is the minimal number of times or the number of times that so that each state of the candidate has been visited at least this number of times. So uh, a fundamental lemma, which is very easy to prove, is that imagine we have a non-final candidate. This means a candidate which has a way out. And imagine it is a non-final candidate of a good run. Then the probability that this non-final candidate reaches a strength k is bounded by one minus p min to the k, where p min is the minimum probability of the transitions of the chain. And uh, why is that? Well, uh, actually what happens is that if uh, uh, it is a non-final candidate, then there is at least one way out. Okay, and uh, since we have visited this state at least k times, right, and we haven't taken this way out, the probability or the probability that this happens is at most once minus p min to the k. Assume first that we know p min, the minimal probability of all the transitions of the chain. Recall that the goal that we want to achieve is to obtain in average one divided by Pg times y minus epsilon restarts, where Pg is the probability of good runs for any epsilon bigger than zero. So what we show in the paper is that this strategy, this bold strategy works. Restart if the ith candidate reaches this strength. That means restart if the first candidate reaches a strength with i equals to one here, or if the second candidate reaches a strength with i equals to two here, or or. So uh, let me show you the dependency of uh, this expression on epsilon and on p min. This expression grows very slowly with epsilon, with a smaller epsilon. So if we fix the p min to 0 0.5, then even if we go to epsilon 0 0.01, 
we still have a moderate strength of I plus seven. But uh, the dependence on femin is uh, much faster. So if we go, if we, even for an epsilon of 0 0.8, if we go to a p-mean, or if we reduce p-mean from 0 0.5 to 0 0.1, we already have here seven times I as the required strength. So what happens now if p-mean is unknown? Uh, at first, this seems like a very difficult problem, but it is actually not. So all we have to do is start assuming some value for p-min and decrease it after each restart with the idea that eventually we will hit the real p-min and we'll even go below it. And when you do the math, uh, what you can show is that this strategy actually achieves this expected number of restarts, the number that we had earlier plus a constant. So it's not really much worse than the previous one. You could say, I don't care so much about the number of restarts. I care about the number of steps that I will have to execute until the last restart, until the final run starts. We show in the paper that the expected number of steps until the last restart is bounded by this expression, where this is a function that doesn't matter very much. The important thing is this cubic uh, dependence on the number of states of the Markov chain, and even more importantly, this exponential dependence on the maximal size of an SCC. So uh, you could say this is very bad, this exponential dependence, but actually uh, what we are going to see is that this is this exponential dependence is also present for the optimal strategy. So you cannot blame the bold strategy for that. And uh, uh, in order to do that, consider this Markov chain. And uh, it is easy to see that the probability of good runs is one half. Those are the runs that reach uh, the state uh, G there. So the uh, average number of restarts of the optimal strategy is going to be two. So the optimal strategy actually is easy to see, even if you know the change, is to restart only if the run reaches the point B. It doesn't make any sense to restart before that. Uh, and uh, the problem is now that then, since the, opti the average number of restarts is two, so uh, you have to exit this very large, uh, strongly connected component twice in average before reaching the state G and therefore uh, producing a good run. And uh, exiting this uh, large strongly connected component is hard. You can show that it takes two to the n minus one steps in average to exit it. And therefore, since you have, will have to exit it twice in average, what we have is that the expected number of steps until the last restart is two to the n. And since n is the size, the maximal size of the strongly connected components, this is two to the mxsc. So even the optimal strategy is exponential in the maximal size of the SEC. Okay, so this concludes the talk. Uh, also in the paper, you can find an efficient implementation of the bold strategy of a monitor that implements it. And you can also find some experimental results on a number of examples. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening and uh, goodbye. Okay, so now I look at the question uh, and uh, I don't see question for the moment. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, uh, you can end up also your end. I know that the talk of Ravier was excellent, but <laughs> maybe you have question. Okay, so waiting for the question. I have one for you, Stefan. Okay, uh, restart is one way to control uh, the Markov chain. Uh, there is also, in general, in control, you can also uh, forbid some transition. Uh, have you thought, uh, uh, it's uh, just an example, have you thought about alternative way of controlling the Markov chain? Um, no, you are pretty much always fixated on this idea of restarting. But I agree, it's a, it's a relevant alternative that you are raising. And uh, is there, uh, you prove that, uh, my, my second question is, you prove that uh, your uh, number of restarts with the bold strategy uh, 
is closed, let's say, uh, asymptotically without considering uh, the constant. In some way, uh, could you have, uh, could you think about uh, even a stronger result, uh, something like, uh, uh, it's some, in some sense, it could be optimal, or is it too difficult to prove? I think we were we were happy because of this sort of asymptotical optimality that Javier mentioned, and then we were we, we didn't try to strengthen this further. Okay, and uh, okay, so I'm waiting for other questions. I don't think there are other questions. Uh, okay, so I thank you a lot, uh, Stefan, uh, for answering the question. And uh, we will uh, switch to the second presenter, which is also a paper uh, co-written by Stefan. And the second presenter will be Cass Win Widershowen. I hope he's, he has arrived. Yeah, I'm here. Ah, okay, thank you. So everybody can see him. And so we, we follow the same. Uh, ah, okay. There is a question for, from Nicola Mazzucci, a former student of mine. You don't have the structure of the Markov chain, but I think you still need the existence of a golden site. Yes, Nicola. Okay, I, I let uh, Stefan answer, but it's, uh, you see the question, Stefan? Um, yes, so we need the existence of a golden state in the sense that um, if we consider the property of visiting golden states infinitely often, which is what uh, Javier gave as an example, then this property can't be satisfied without a golden state. In fact, we require a positive probability of satisfying this property. Um, the golden state business was only for the talk. It's a, it's a good example, but in general, we, we consider LTL properties. And uh, in fact, we assume that the LTL property is given as a, as a Rabin automaton. Uh, and the number of states, um, we don't need it for the, uh, for the restart strategy. But the number of states goes in uh, to the uh, to the quantitative results and the expected number of restarts, etc. That uh, Javier mentioned. Okay, so uh, and yes, we we don't need the structure of the um, Markov chain. That's right. Yes. So so the, the question of Nicola uh, triggers me another question. Uh, uh, why do you choose uh, this kind of uh, automata? Why not? There are a lot of equivalent automata to. Is, is, is there an hidden uh, idea that I did not uh, take, or uh, is it indifferent to use uh, uh, deterministic, uh, for example? Here you use Rabin automaton, but for, for example, why not strict automaton? Or, oh, or... so that, that would be. Uh, I, I don't think that there is a um, significant reason. So we, ah, okay. we took this as, as a sort of standard thing that captures full LTL, um, but you, you might well be right that deterministic street automata might equally well suit it. Okay, yes, this, this is what I was thinking, but I was not sure. I prefer to ask the question. Okay, thank sure. you very much. And now we, I think, uh, thanks, Nicola, for this additional question. And now we switch to the, so we, everybody has seen CAS and uh, we can switch to the video. So Anissa, uh, you can uh, launch the video. My name is Kas Beershoven. Good afternoon. My name is Kas Beershoven and I will be presenting the paper Linear Time Model Checking Branching Processes. This is a collaboration with Stefan Kiefer and Pavel Samukin at the University of Oxford. So the main problem that this paper solves is the following. Given a branching process and an LTL formula, is it true that almost surely all the branches of a tree generated by this branching process satisfy this LTL formula? We've shown that uh, the problem whether this is almost surely true is P-space complete, and the problem that this is almost never true is to X-time complete. In fact, we've shown quite a bit more 
uh, in the process of sharing this main theorem. So this is a quick overview of our results. Uh, on the first line, we have the probability that a branching process that allows epsilon rules, so rules where a type can be a terminal. So the problem that a branching process generates a finite tree where every branch ends in a terminal, that this problem can be solved in NC. Uh, the problem that a branching process generates almost surely a tree where every branch uh, adheres to a specification given by a deterministic parity automaton. The problem that is almost surely true is in NC, and the problem that is always never true is in, a, in P. Uh, for non-deterministic Bucci automata, we, see, we show that the almost sure problem is in P space, and the almost never problem in F time. For co non deterministic Bucchi automata, so where every branch has to be rejected by a non deterministic Bucchi automaton, we show that almost sure is in P space and almost never in X time. Uh, if we change this non deterministic Bucchi automaton to an unambiguous Bucchi automaton, we show that the almost sure case becomes easier. Now we can do this in NC, and uh, this will finally give us our main result. So almost surely every branch uh, adheres to an LTL formula is in P space and almost never the case that every branch adheres to an LTL formula is in 2x prime. So I mentioned the class NC here which you may not may or may not be uh, familiar with but quickly said this is a problem a problem is in NC if it can be solved in uh, polylogarithmic time by a polynomial number of processes. I will be focusing mostly on the almost sure case in this talk. We do give the proof for the almost never give cases in our paper, uh, but I, I think they fall out of the outside the scope of this talk. I will quickly say, however, that we achieve this usually through uh, a reduction from alternating Turing machines, space bounded alternating Turing machines. All right, so let's get back to our original question. I mentioned these branching processes. What are branching processes? So a multi-type branching process is a tuple B given by a set of types, gamma, a set of derivation rules, which is denoted by this hook, hook arrow, uh, a function that assigns probabilities to these uh, to these derivation rules and an initial state x0. In a sense you could view these as stochastic context-free grammars. In general we will say they have no terminal sy symbols so uh, every type will be mapped to at least one more one other type. We don't allow any epsilon rules. Uh, but obviously for the finite case we will, you will allow epsilon rules, I will mention it when we do. So these branching processes, they generalize both Markov chains and transition systems. Uh, all right, so let's firstly go through an example of a pure, pure branching process. So here we got three types, I, B and D. Uh, we see that I gets mapped to another instance of I with probability 0.9 and to I and B with probability 0.1. See that B gets mapped to D with probability 0.2, to B with probability 0.5 and to two copies of B with probability 0.3. And we see that D always gets mapped to D. So this can generate a tree, for instance, uh, beginning in the bit that you see at the bottom of this slide here. So what happens is we start with our initial node, so it's of type i in this case, and we take one of the transitions with a probability given by this pro given by this rule. Here we see that uh, the first rule that we took was i goes to ib, so we took that with probability 0.1. Then uh, in breath first order, the next i gets mapped to i with probability 0.9. The B gets mapped to BB with probability 0.3. Uh, 
etc. So a tree generated by this branch process would start with this prefix with probability, well, 0 0.9 times 0.1 times uh, 0.3. Uh, in fact, this specific example already shows an interesting property of these branching processes, namely that the, the actual numbers inside of this branching process matter even for these uh, qualitative questions that we are asking. So how do they matter in this case? Uh, well, you, one might ask, what is the probability that all branches uh, it, is, the probability, is it almost certainly the case that all branches end up in a type D. In this specific branching process, this is not the case. And why is that? Well, that is because uh, the probability that B branches out into two Bs is greater than the probability that B ends in a dying state in a D type. Uh, so if we would actually swap the probabilities, so say that B goes to D with probability 0.3 and B goes to BB with probability 0.2, then uh, it would be the case that almost surely all the branches of a tree generated by this branching process end in D. So I mentioned that uh, branching processes generalize both Markov chains and, Markov and, uh, and transition systems. I'll give you a quick example for that as well. Uh, so at the top you see a Markov chain. An initial state X, uh, which goes with probability 1 to Y, and a state Y, which goes with probability 0.7 back to Y, and 0.3 back to X. Uh, this branching process, or this Markov chain, can be simula simulated by a branching process that is given below. So X goes with probability 1 to Y, Y goes with probability 0.3, to a single state x and y goes with probability 0.7 to y. As you'll see, uh, the right hand side of all these transitions have only one type. So the trees generated by this branching process, they will be degenerate trees, so trees where every node has exactly one child. Uh, for transition systems, we see that uh, suppose that we have a transition system given as above, so x goes to y and y goes to both y and x. This transition system can be simulated with the branching process at the bottom, so x with, goes to y with probability 1 and y goes to x, y also with probability 1. You'll notice that in this case uh, the left hand sides are unique. So uh, there's only one rule for every type, and that means that the trees that this branching process generates are that there is only one unique tree that this branching process can uh, generate, each of which branches correspond to a path in the transition system. So we, we begin by deciding whether it is almost surely the case that a branching process with epsilon rules generates a finite tree. Uh, so we begin by defining a graph where between two types x and y there is an edge from x to y if and only if there is a transition from x to a word containing y. It is relatively easy to see that uh, a tree generated by this branching process is infinite with positive probability if and only if there exists an SEC of this transition graph uh, such that and a type X in this SEC such that this type X is reachable from the initial state of the branching process and uh, the branching process starting in this type is infinite with positive probability or actually a, a branching process that starts from this type X and stays within this SEC S. Uh, so now we define a, a sort of expected, expected number of successors matrix. We call this matrix M, and the value of M, uh, M is indexed by the, the types, and the value of M x comma y is equal to, well, the sum of all the possible transitions 
times of the probability of that transition times the number of y successors in this transition. We will call this matrix supercritical if its spectral radius is greater than one. So the spectral radius is the largest absolute of its eigenvalues. And we call it linear if for all rules x to w and any type y, there's exactly one occurrence in w of this type y. We have shown in our paper that uh, a tree generated by this boundary process is infinite with positive probability if and only if there exists an SEC S, a reachable SEC S, a reachable from the initial state of the branching process, that is either whose matrix M is either supercritical or uh, this S is linear. All right, so uh, since calculating SECs can be done in, in uh, NC and calculating the spectral radius of a matrix can be done in L NC and this linearity condition can be checked in NC that means that we can solve our probability finite question in NC. Uh, so now we will use this to solve the next question namely given a, a specification given by a deterministic parity, of, parity automaton is it almost surely the case that a tree generated by its branching process, all of its branches are satisfy the, the specification given by our deterministic parity automaton? So this is actually an adaptation from uh, a proof from a paper by Taulua Chen, Klaus Dreger, and Stefan Kiefer, where they already show that this problem is in P. Uh, they define a certain set n of x. And uh, they say, okay, if it is almost surely the case that eventually we reach a state in this set n of x, then it is almost surely the case that all the branches satisfy this, this specification given by the deterministic parity at Thompson. Uh, well, actually, given a set of types t, the probability that almost all branches reach this reach a state in this set of type in this uh, set of types whether the probability is equal to one for that is relatively easy to solve given our probability that the tree is finite namely you simply re remove any occurrence of these states t from the right hand side of our transitions and the resulting branching process with epsilon rules allowed is finite if and only if all branches reach all branching the original branching process reach a set uh, a state a set uh, sorry a node with the type in T. So this gives us uh, actually an NC procedure to determine whether almost surely all branches satisfy the, the DPA specification. Uh, so we also show that the problem where it's almost never the case that all branches satisfy is is P complete. Uh, so we do that with a reduction from the monotone surface value problem, which is in the in our paper. So now, you, knowing this, we will move to the uh, specifications given by non-deterministic Buki automata. Well, this is act, follows actually relatively simply from the de deterministic parity automata. Hardness already fo follows from model checking Markov chains or transition systems from MBAs and membership follows from uh, a standard construction translating non-deterministic Buki automata into deterministic parity automata. So this construction can be done with a P-space transducer and combining this P-space transducer and the NC model checking procedure gives us a P-space model checking procedure. Right? Remember that NC uh, is a subset of polylogarithmic space. Uh, we also show that the probability whether this is almost never true is x time complete. We do this with a reduction from a p-space bounded alternating Turing machine, which is in the appendix of a paper. Uh, now we move on to the problem whether almost all branches are rejected by non-deterministic Buki automata. Well, since complementation of deterministic parity automata can be done in polynomial space, 
So you simply add one to every priority. Uh, we could again do this through a translation to deterministic parity automata. However, we will do this slightly differently. Uh, the construction that we're using here will actually help us in showing uh, our, our main result for LTL using unambiguous Buki automata. So firstly, we define the product automaton A times B, whose states are uh, the products of states and types, so states of the automaton and types of the branching process, and where the transition uh, where the transition relation basically takes the state and type that it's in and goes through the transitions in the original automaton and adds on the new type. Uh, so this is a relatively straightforward product automaton. Similarly to the question whether a branching process almost sure almost surely generates a finite tree. We will now look at the SECs of this product automaton and we see that uh, the probability that, that some branch of a tree generated by this branch process has a branch that's accepted by the non-deterministic uh, non automaton is positive if and only if uh, it can reach some SEC and the branching process starting in the state of that SEC generates with positive probability a branch that is accepted by uh, this uh, product automaton stay in this SEC. So now we will focus our we will focus on on these SECs. And we will firstly define a determinization. So we define a debt being the determinization of an SEC within this product automaton using a standard subset construction. We will define a uh, derived branching process, B debt, uh, that where basically the branches of this of a tree generated by this automaton corresponds to the runs of the automaton. So the runs of the, the, the states of this A debt as it goes through a branch uh, generated by the original branching process. Uh, so now the probability that some branch of the original automaton, so the original automaton restricted to its SEC, is positive, if and only if uh, there exists, if and only if there, the probability that some branch of this determined, determinized branching process, so this B debt, does not have any nodes of type empty set. So what does it mean? Well, uh, basically, if uh, if this B that reaches an empty set type, then it, it will stay in this empty set. But if it doesn't, then there's always a positive probability of, of reaching an accepting state of the, of the Buki automaton again. And hence, uh, if B that generates with positive probability a tree with where some branch is uh, does not have any nodes of type empty set, then with positive probability it will generate a tree where some branch visits accepting states of the automaton infinitely often. So now we've reduced this question whether the, the original branching process generates uh, a tree where every branch is almost surely generates a tree where every branch is rejected by a Buki automaton to a reachability question in this determinized uh, branching process. So uh, you should notice that actually the size of this new branching process is exponential, combining, the, combining uh, but it can be done through a p-space transducer. 
combining this this uh, piece space transducer construction of this BDAT with a reachability analysis, which we have shown earlier, is in NC. Uh, we get a piece space procedure to check whether the original branching process um, generates almost surely a tree uh, where every branch is rejected by the non deterministic Buki automaton. So now we will use a very similar technique to show that if the non-deterministic Buki automaton was actually an ambiguous Buki automaton, we can do this entire process in NC. In order to adapt the proof for the co-NBA case to unambiguous automata to improve on its complexity, uh, we define a matrix M indexed by the states in this uh, product automaton SEC subset, uh, where the QX comma RY indexed entry is basically the expected number of Y successors of X if uh, there is a transition from QX to RY in the product automaton. We will also need to consider the branching in this SEC automaton because uh, this matrix M incorporates both the branching of the product automaton, which incorporates the branching process and the original UBA, and the branching of the branching process. So we say that this automaton has proper branching if there exists an error from a QY type in this SC automaton to an R1Z1 type over a letter Z1 and uh, a transition over letter Z2 from QY to R2Z2 and a rule from Y that goes into both Z1 and Z2 in the original branching process. So now uh, we can again uh, compare the spectral radius of this matrix given by the SEC automaton and we see that uh, with positive probability uh, this B dead tree has a branch without any epsilon nodes if either the spectral radius of this matrix M is greater than 1 or the spectral radius is equal to 1 and this uh, product automaton does not have proper branching. Uh, so now we've got this, this property that tells us something about this B dead tree, which was exponentially sized using only the polynomially sized M. So again, we can calculate this, the spectral radius of this matrix in NC, and we can ca calculate whether this AFXF has proper branching. AFXF again is the, the, spe the uh, SEC automaton is polynomially sized, so we can check whether that has proper branching also in NC, giving us a model checking algorithm to see whether the uh, branching process almost surely generates a tree, all of whose branches are rejected by a given ambiguous Buki automaton. That gives us our theorem. Uh, so that finally finally leads us to the final result, namely the, pro the model checking of, again, of branch processes against LTL formula. So to, re to reiterate, the, uh, this problem asks whether every branch of a tree generated by a branch process, almost surely every branch uh, is, satisfies an LTL formula. So what we do is we given the formula phi, we translate this formula into its negation and translate this negation into an exponentially sized unambiguous Buki automaton. This can be done using a p-space transducer. Uh, so if almost every, if every branch uh, is accepted by this resulting Buki automaton, or if every branch is rejected by this uh, resulting Buki automaton, that means that every branch does satisfy every branch does not satisfy the formula not phi and hence every branch satisfies the formula phi. Uh, so combining this piece space transducer and our anti procedure gives us our headline result, namely uh, probability of 
checking whether almost surely every branch of a tree generated by a branch process satisfies an LCL formula. So that concludes our talk and I'd be happy to hear if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I look at the question. Uh, okay. In order to wait for uh, some additional question, I have a, a, a question is, of course, you, you solve the problem of uh, probability one or zero. And the natural question is what happens if I want to compute uh, exactly or uh, exactly, I imagine it's uh, difficult, uh, maybe not, but it seems to me that it's difficult, but approximately, if I give you epsilon and I say, can you give me a, a value which is no less than epsilon, uh, uh, the value I want to compute, no, 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 no further, far from uh, this from epsilon have you thought about this question uh we have not really thought about this question obviously this would be at least as hard as the probability zero case uh if we want to compute it exactly okay and uh, so i'm waiting for question yet no question okay Last chance for a question? No. So I thank you again. And thank you, uh, and thank you uh, Cass. And we uh, switch to the third presenter, which is uh, Jacob Piri Bauer. I hope I pronounce correctly, uh, or at least not so badly. <laughs> and so you can see him on the, the screen. And now, uh, and, and this talk will be, excuse me, this, this talk will be also uh, about model checking probabilistic system. And uh, here, it's a particular logic, which is called QTL, which use quantifier, uh, which allow quantifier in LTL formula. And so, uh, uh, Anissa, when you want, Hello, come to this talk on quantified propositional linear temporal logic over probabilistic systems with an application to vacuity checking. This is joint work with Nathalie Bertrand, Ochen Zankur, and Crystal Bayer. And to begin, I want to talk about this logic, quantified propositional linear temporal logic, which I think is not that well known, but it is a nice logic that can be used in different application areas. So let me start by quickly explaining the syntax of this logic. We start with the syntax of linear temporal logic, where we have the usual Boolean connectives and the temporal operators, the next and an until. And additionally, we have atomic propositions from a finite set AP and propositional variables. And then we allow quantification over these propositional variables as the name of the logic suggests. So syntactically, we only add this existential quantifier, exists X. And of course we can by the usual abbreviations also have universal quantifiers and the other temporal operators eventually and globally and so on. And we require that all variables are quantified in the end because that allows us to give the semantics then over words over two to the atomic propositions. And from the semantics, I only briefly want to explain the quantifier. So the meaning of exists X is that there is a set of positions at which we can make X true such that the remaining formula holds. So this example word here satisfies the formula because we can simply add x in all the positions where not a holds and then the resulting word will satisfy globally x if and only if not a. So this is in fact a tautology in QLTL. And as you see this is a kind of a second order quantification, it ranges over sets of positions and with this second order quantification the expressive power of QLTL can capture exactly the omega regular languages it has the same expressive power as non-deterministic Vichy automata, which was shown by Sisler in 1983, who introduced this logic. And this logic can be applied to different problems in formal verification. And I just want to list a few examples where this logic has been used. So quite early on, it has been used to define refinement relations. Uh, a bit more precisely, this means if we have formulas phi and psi, let's say LTL formulas that describe system behaviors, 
then we can say that phi refines psi if there is a set of internal variables v such that once we quantify the, these variables in phi, it becomes equivalent to psi, maybe up to the repetition of steps, which is denoted by the stutter here. So to give a quick example, we could think of phi describing the correct behavior of a clock with an hours, a minute, and a seconds place, while psi describes the correct behavior of a clock only with, with an hours and a minutes place. And then if we existentially quantify away the seconds in phi, then these formulas are equivalent. So we can, a correct behavior with hours and minutes always has a possible way to extend it with a second place, such that this is then a correct clock with hours, minutes, and seconds. A few other applications from literature were, for example, a ser serializability of histories and concurrent database scheduling, or unrealizability of distributed fault-tolerant systems, and also vacuity checking. And vacuity checking is the application I will come back to later on and explain it in more detail. And as the title suggests, we want to investigate QLTL over probabilistic systems, and in particular the model checking problem. So let me quickly tell you what I mean by probabilistic systems. And on the one hand side, I mean Markov chains, deterministic time Markov chains, which are purely probabilistic. So in each state, there is, there are multiple outgoing transitions annotated with probability values that uh, describe the probability distribution according to which the successor state of the state S here, for example, is chosen. And so if you let a Markov chain run, it produces infinite runs together with a probability distribution over these runs. And if we now have a specification phi, we are interested in the probability mass of all the executions that satisfy the specification phi. And a qualitative question is then often, is this probability equal to 1? So do almost all paths satisfy the specification phi? And on the other hand side, we look at Markov decision processes, which additionally have non-deterministic choices. So in this example here, we have sigma and tau, two different actions available in state S. And depending on which action we choose, there's a different probability distribution over successive states. Under tau, there's probability 1 that we reach t afterwards, and under sigma, probability is two-thirds that we reach the initial state as init here, and one-third that we reach the state t. And in the presence of these non-deterministic choices, we do not have a unique probability measure anymore, but we can talk about worst or best case probabilities, or the minimal or maximal satisfaction probability of phi in this MDP, where minimum and maximum range over all possible resolutions of the non-deterministic choices. So this is very useful for worst or best case analysis. And the quant qualitative questions then are whether these minimal or maximal probabilities are equal to one. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the model check problem for QLTL and what is already known. And here it turns out that this is particularly interesting to look at the quantifier alternation hierarchy of QLTL. So we define these set sigma k QLTL and pi k QLTL as all the formulas that have k minus one quantifier alternations in the front. So all quantifiers have to be put in front in Prenix normal form. And if the first quantifier is an existential quantifier, we say it is a sigma k formula. And if it starts with a block of universal quantifiers, we say it's a pi k QLTL formula. And the interesting thing is now that over transition systems, it is known that the complexity of the model checking problem increases by exactly one exponential per quantifier alternation. So what does that mean more precisely? So I listed LTL model checking here in this table as a reference as well. Over transition systems, LTL model checking is p-space complete and pi1 QLTL model checking stays p-space complete as well, while sigma1 QLTL model checking is already x-space complete. And then for each further quantifier alternation, we get an increase by exactly one exponential in the complexity here. And this was shown by Sisla, Vardy, and Wolper in 1985. And we are now interested in these model checking problems over probabilistic systems. And for LTL model checking, it's of course well known that LTL model checking is p-space complete in Markov chains and to extend complete in MDPs. And if we now transfer these results, the upper bounds from these results, to Markov chains and MDPs, we straightforwardly get uh, Again, of course, this increased by one exponential per quantifier alternation because also these model checking problems are solved by constructing 
non thermistic diffusion automata for QHL formulas, and the automata just increase by more exponential per quantifier alternation. And for these upper bounds, it's maybe already remarkable that for MDPs, LTL and pi 1 and sigma 1 QLTL model checking all have the same 2x prime upper bound, while for Markov chains, this uh, upper bound via automata increases by one exponential already for pi 1 and sigma 1 QLTL model checking. And afterwards, we then have this increase by one exponential per quantifier alternation. And a main contribution of our paper is now that we prove that these are actually all completeness results, so we uh, prove matching lower bounds. And the proofs are a bit tedious and quite technical, but I would want to give an intuition of how these proofs work uh, for the case of Pi 1 QLTL model checking in Markov chains. And the problem we reduce from to show X space hardness is an exponential tiling problem, which goes as follows. We are given a set of tiles T and a natural number n in unary, two relations h and v over t that encode the horizontal and vertical condition according to which tiles can be placed next to each other, a final tile tf and an initial tile t0. And the question is then, is there a rectangle of height 2 to the n that can be tiled with these tiles? So the question is, is there some natural number m such that the rectangle 2 to the n times m can be tiled such that we have the initial tile in the bottom left corner, the final tile in the bottom right corner, and all neighboring tiles satisfy the horizontal or vertical condition, respectively. And if we now have a potential tiling where tiles are placed at each of these positions in such a grid, we can encode this potential tiling into a word by just starting with a start marker and ending with an end marker. And in between, we just list these tiles column by column. But in between, we also include a binary counter with n bits that encodes the position of the tile in the column. So this uh, counter just has to be a correct binary counter, modulo 2 to the n. And the idea is now that we can quite easily provide a Markov chain m that in each run almost surely produces all words of this form. And then the remaining ingredient we need for our reduction is also a pi 1 QLTL formula that expresses that eventually there is a valid tiling encoded in an infinite word. And the main idea how we can use the quantification of pi 1 QLTL to do that is that we can universally quantify two variables x and y that are used as markers to detect potential violations to the horizontal condition, because the horizontal condition is the difficult one to check here. So the, checking that the initial tile is correct and that the final tile is correct and so on in some subword starting with start and ending in end is uh, doable in LTL. And also the vertical condition is not too hard to check because the vertical tiles follow each other in this word here. But the horizontally adjacent tiles are exponentially far apart. So this T000 here and this T100 here, those are placed exponentially many steps apart. And the idea that we use is now that we have these universally quantified var variables x and y, and then we require that globally x and y hold at most once between start and end, and only on tiles, and that uh, they are followed by the same counter value, which we can then express once exactly one tile is marked with x and one tile is marked with y between start and end. And well, we need some more conditions, for example, that no tile in between has the same counter value, which requires an additional quantifier. Uh, which I have hidden here. But in this way, we can make sure that whenever the, the markers are placed according to these rules, then we will eventually find a start position after which the following pair of marked tiles satisfies the horizontal condition and all the other conditions for valid tiling, which are LTL expressible, are satisfied. And so if there is no valid tiling, that whenever all the remaining conditions are met by some word, between start and end, then we can place x and y onto a pair of tiles that do not satisfy the horizontal condition but are horizontally adjacent, and then we will not find such a word. But if there is a valid tiling, then no matter how, how x and y are placed, either they don't satisfy the sole precondition here, or the marked tiles satisfy h, then this formula can exactly express that there is a valid tiling. So this means that this formula holds 
with probability 1 in m if and only if there is a valid tiling, which uh, gives us x space completeness for the model checking problem of pi 1 q ATL in Markov chains. And for the remaining hardness results, we need some additional ingredients. On one hand side, that there are yardstick formulas, which are taken from the Sislavardian Wolper paper from 1985, with which they also obtain this exponential increase per quantifier generation. So we can reuse the formulas constructed there. And for MDPs, the idea is to encode alternating k exponentially space bounded Turing machines. And in such an alternating Turing machine, acceptance can be defined via a game where a universal player plays against an existential player trying to prove that the word is accepted by the Turing machine or not. And we can then let this game be played by a scheduler that resolves the non-deterministic choices in the MDP versus a random player. And it is well known that alternating k exponentially space-bounded Turing machines capture exactly k plus 1 x time. And so this altogether gives us our completeness results here. And so we have this nice table where we see that after the first level of quantifier alternation, we then have this ex ex exponential increase per quantifier alternation. And the remarkable entry is maybe in particular this one, pi 1 QLTL model checking Markov chains is exponentially harder than in transition systems, but also exponentially harder than LTL model checking in Markov chains, which we do not observe for transition systems or MDPs here. Okay, and as mentioned earlier, one application for which we want to use this result now is vacuity checking. So what is vacuous satisf satisfaction and vacuity checking? Let me just uh, give a short example in words. So let's say we have a specification that all requests are eventually answered. Of course, the requirement we impose onto a system. And then a model checker verifies that the given model M for which we want to establish this property satisfies the specification. So everything seems good and usually you would just continue with the design process and think that at least on this level there are no errors. But a vacuity checker could now detect that there are no requests sent in the model and so that this specification is somehow vacuously true. If there are no requests and all requests are eventually answered is correct but this are eventually answered actually doesn't play a role. We could write anything here and it would still be true. And this is the idea behind a prominent definition of vacuous satisfaction, which we cite here from the literature, um, which goes as follows. So we have an LTL formula phi and a subformula psi, and we have a transition system T in which this formula phi holds. And then we say that this subformula psi does not affect phi in T. If T would still satisfy the formula if we replace psi by a variable x and universally quantify this variable. So if we can change the truth value of psi after each step by some arbitrary permutation, perturbation, then t still satisfies phi, so it actually doesn't matter what psi says. And so this psi would precisely correspond to this. I eventually answered no matter what you write here, the specification would still hold if there are no requests sent in the model. And then we say that phi holds vacuously in t if there is a subformula that does not affect phi in t. And well, to transfer this to our probabilistic setting, we first uh, generalize this definition to the probabilistic setting, where now if we have an LTL formula phi and a subformula psi, and we take an MDP or a Markov chain M, then we say that psi does not affect phi in M if the minimal probability that for all x, phi where psi is replaced by this universally quantified variable x, if and only if phi holds the probability 1. And so what does it mean? That means that on almost all paths, under any possible way to re uh, resolve non-deterministic choices, the truth value does almost truly not change when we replace psi by a universally quantified variable x. So this is, this is a quite strong requirement, but if this is the case, then one certainly would want to say that something is wrong here. This formula psi does not play a role at all in this model for the satisfaction of phi. <coughs> okay, and for this QLTL-based definition of vacuity as well as 
the one that I've shown you before for transition systems, it turns out that vacuity checking is as hard as pi one QLTL model checking. So checking whether there is a subformula that uh, does not affect phi. And if we now look at our complexity table, we see that this in fact means for Markov chains, this definition is probably not that helpful in practice because then the vacuity check is at least complexity-wise exponentially harder than the LTL model checking itself. And if one wants to include a vacuity check into the model checking procedure, then it would be very desirable that the complexity does not increase by doing so. And so in transition, transition systems, we can add this vacuity check without an increase in complexity. And in MDPs, we can do the same. But in Markov chains, we have an exponential increase here. So one way to avoid this problem is to instead have a look for the notion of inherent vacuity, which goes as follows. So an LTL formula phi is called inherently vacuous for a class of model C if it is vacuous in all models in C. So if in all models we can find a subformula psi that does not affect the formula phi. But of course this definition now doesn't respect the interplay between phi and a single model anymore. So it cannot detect as many errors in the design of specification and model together, but it can at least detect errors in the design of the specification itself. And it turns out that all reasonable notions of inherent vacuity for transition systems, for Markov chains, and for MVPs agree, and that they can all be checked in polynomial space. And so an inherent vacuity check is not that expensive and could be included into a model checking procedure for LTL and Markov chains without increasing the complexity. Okay, so let me briefly summarize what we have seen. So we have pinpointed the complexities for the full quantifier alternation hierarchy of QLTL, pi k QLTL and sigma k QLTL model checking over probabilistic systems. And it, in particular, the lower bounds, which we proved, which are non-trivial, could be potentially useful to establish hardness results in the formulation of probabilistic systems for further problems. And the first such problem was security checking for LTL over Markov chains, according to this QLTL-based definition, which is exponentially harder than LTL model checking. And we've seen that one way to avoid this exponential increase could be to just look for inherent vacuity. But it also means that further, possibly also more probabilistic notions of vacuity could be fruitful, because our definition does not respect the probabilities very much. It just says that on almost no path, the, probability, uh, the satisfaction can be changed by replacing the subformula by a universally quantified variable. So there are certainly other interesting notions one could have a look at. Um, but these more probabilistic notions also are a bit difficult, because then not only the graph structure and so on is important, but also the precise probability values. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see if there are further notions that then potentially can also be checked in polynomial space for Markov chains and LTL model checking. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions at the question and answer session at Concur. Thank you. Okay, so I'm happy because there is a question and you can see it, I think. Uh... Uh, can you yes. see the question? So I, uh, I let you answer the question. I can say, tell it. Is there any complexity result on checking those QT, QLTL formula over Markov games? Okay. Yeah, so I guess uh, by Markov games, you mean some sort of stochastic games. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked at games here, and I'm quite sure that there's also no result in this direction in the literature. But um, yeah, of course, it could be interesting to have a look there. And um, yeah, maybe our lower bounds for MDPs could somehow help to also establish lower bounds for games. But yeah, I cannot say much more at the moment. OK, and uh, yeah, OK, so we have uh, one question. You mentioned at the beginning uh, that uh, QLTL could be used for uh, vacuity shaking and other, two, other prop, two other, let's say, meta properties. I don't know how to tell it. Uh, uh, have you thought about uh, this other application? Well, we haven't really spent uh, 
much time looking at whether there is a good probabilistic analog to these notions. But I could imagine that especially for this concurrent database scheduling and serializability there, it could make sense to also look at the probabilistic scenario there. And then one could probably take the formulations used over the non-probabilistic setting where the serializability, if, if a specification is given an LTL, one wants to know whether all uh, concurrent database or all results of concurrent database scheduling are then serializability if they satisfy this specification. One could certainly use this QLTL formulation and see if, if introducing some probabilism into the model makes, makes sense. And I have another question because you, you mentioned uh, at different moment of your talk that uh, uh, you wanted to be efficient, not only asymptotically and for complexities, but I imagine that you have in idea uh, some tools, have you tools for uh, QLTL in mind or developed or designed? Um, well, we haven't, we haven't implemented anything. Um, but do, I do, mean, you especially... know, do you know if there is some tool in the in the state of the art? So not uh, only your tool, but uh, yeah. mm, well, I'm I'm not really aware of a tool. I mean, well, I, I guess there's uh, has been not not done much research on this on efficient QLTL model checking besides constructing these automata, which uh, just involves a lot of complementations of non-deterministic species automata for which of course there is a large toolbox available. So maybe this already is to some extent efficient, but I mean, the complexities grow very quickly, right? So the interesting questions, if we really want to have efficient algorithms is probably mostly about the lower levels of the hierarchy. And um, there, I think there's some hope to uh, get some efficient algorithms, because if you start by constructing automaton for the LTL part, then at least on the first level of the quantified alternation hierarchy, uh, this quantification on the level of the automaton is, is rather easy. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't. Okay, no, because uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, because you, it's just to, just it's easy to say, but not easy to implement, to, to trans, translate your uh, formula in some automaton, yes, and then use uh, some uh, standard tool uh, like Prism or no. Uh, yeah. So it could be it could be given to some uh, engineers, uh, research engineer to develop it. It's a, a suggestion, it's no more a question, it's a suggestion. In yeah, order to, sure, sure. to extend the scope of your result, just uh, yeah. I think it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, certainly. Uh, is there other question? Okay, I don't see other question because I think we are we are, we had time. You were quite okay. I have to look at the program. Ah oh, no, we are late. Ah, excuse me, we are late. Okay, so uh, uh, now we are at the coffee uh, break. If I am, uh, and I let uh, I think we start again uh, at uh, a quarter to four. Uh, I let uh, I switch to the organizer. Thank you very much.